Okay. Well, welcome to part four of four of women in the uh, American, in early America. Today, we're going to be talking about the American Revolution and the early Republic. Uh, how women, how important women were to those things, uh, which is often something we don't think of and certainly something that I didn't get when I was taught these things, at least not until college. So. So in the lead up to the revolution, uh, women's value within the society changed, okay? Last time we talked about how women were, I'm trying the right way to say this, women were more valued in a wider sense because of what was needed to be done on a, a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year basis, okay? And everybody who was capable of doing whatever work that needed to be done was doing it, okay? Also, as we have the colonies becoming more quote unquote civilized, the gender ratio evens out. The other big reason that women were so important in those early years of the colonies was that there were so few, right? So when you have fewer women to more men, they're going to become more uh, valuable to use an objective term there. But just as the, uh, the areas where they had been more valued uh, were de-emphasized, we start to see more value in the role of parenting, okay? And so their position as those who uh, uh, are caring for the children as opposed to those who are providing and producing materials uh, the, the children are more valued. Of course, that doesn't actually mean that they're doing any less providing and producing, okay? It's just that that's not, that's not where they're seen in society anymore, okay? Uh, right, from Gail Collins, lost my quote here. Uh, Gail Collins says this about it, quote, just as women were losing their status as household providers, they were gaining respect as mothers. This was a new idea. To the 17th century opinion makers, uh, to the degree that the sense, let me start over, quote, just as women were losing their status as household providers, they were gaining respect as mothers. This was a new idea. To the degree that 17th century opinion makers ever thought of child rearing at all, it was in terms of the father's role. But as fathers absented themselves from the home, mothers became the main nurturers of the next generation. People tended to think uh, particularly in Europe, of the father's influence. And it wasn't that they didn't think that a mother didn't have influence. It was just that the father being the breadwinner, being the legal entity that represented the family was deemed to be more important. So as I said, even though we have this de-emphasis on women providing for the family, the reality of it didn't actually change, okay? Or changed very little. They don't have to make their own cloth anymore. Okay, necessarily, that's a, that's a huge thing. Once you have regularized trade between Britain uh, and then the rest of Europe and the American colonies, you get to a point where you're going to have that cloth coming back and forth. Uh, we're also early into, after we get past the revolution, we're into the early part of the industrial revolution, at which point one of the main things that were being industrialized in England was uh, textile production. So that gives them that advantage. But it's one step of many. So yes, they don't have to produce the cloth for themselves anymore, but they are still responsible for, you know, sewing it, shaping it into wearable clothes and whatever else is needed around the house from the cloth. Food preparation is, has not changed, okay? The political situation changing does not change how uh, the food is, is being prepared we're still dealing with an oven uh, and a stove that is fueled with flame, okay? Or an open fire that you're cooking over, like in the drawing there. Um, that kind of thing is not going to change until we have, uh, well, you know, stoves that can be properly calibrated and uh, change the temperature and maintain a, a particular temperature. And of course, women still do bear the responsibility of household chores. Um, so there's that and probably more if you think about it because if there are if the sex ratio 
has evened out, there's probably fewer men who are willing to be uh, involved in those household chores uh, because they don't have to be anymore. So. Uh, we also see at this time an emphasis of women's role as the moral compass of the family, okay? The women are the ones who were to make sure that everybody went to services, that everybody was uh, making sure that they didn't sin, you know, or asking forgiveness for those sins, saying regular prayers, that kind of thing. Of course, this is very particularly within that Protestant Christian context. Okay? We don't see a lot, you don't see a lot of women who are not some version of Protestant Christian uh, with the exception of somewhere like Maryland, where you have a lot of Catholics, but you're still dealing with uh, Christianity there. Uh, and even though women don't have leadership roles in the religious community, except for the Quakers, okay, they tend to be the ones who are behind the scenes of the religious movements that we see in the era, and particularly that is uh, the Great Awakening. And I see I put this on here twice. Okay, there you go. That's all right. So th there is this idea of uh, women making sure that everyone in the family is going to be uh, doing what they're supposed to religiously. It, it's, there's also a fine line here because women are not supposed to be involved in any po political decision making, any major decision making. Uh, obviously within the, within the churches, uh, to some extent within the family. Uh, uh, Carol Burke in, in her book, uh, First Generations, says this about it. Quote, it was widely believed that women's political choices were and ought to be controlled by male relatives. This natural subordination based on gender was reinforced by a social subordination based on the absence of property. A propertyless person could take no part in making political decisions. We're at the point where voting rights are dictated by ownership of property. Okay? We're not going to get past that until well into the 19th century when we're uh, long after the period of our class is over. So the first thing, of course, if a person is not able to legally own property, then they're not going to be able to vote because so you had to meet that minimum property requirement. Women, uh, if they're married, they are not able to own property in their own name uh, at this point. Uh, yes, there's some workarounds. I know we talked last week about uh, instances where that is uh, the case where they are able to hold property in their name, particularly slaves, but it's landed property that is needed for uh, voting rights. Now, what about single women? Single women over the age of 21 could own property in their own name, but they still couldn't vote. So, you know, that, that's, Voting was for propertied white men, basically, at this point. Goofed up my slides here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Right. So even as these ex expectations changed, uh, women's subordinate position wasn't questioned. And, and that's true uh, of both men and women. Uh, you see... It, the men, of course, are not going to be at the forefront of pushing for women to be able to vote, to be able to necessarily own property in their own right, that kind of thing. I'm not saying there weren't any, but it's not gonna to be top of their lists, particularly in this era. Um, and there were a lot of women who were perfectly happy with the way things were, or at least they were not in a position where they could push for any changes, okay? Uh, we do see some who do though. And we'll talk about that because uh, New Jersey left the voting regulations wide open and women took advantage of that in the early Republic. At this point too, we are uh, at a point where the society can have a leisure class, okay? Um, that is really only about the last century or so prior to the revolution, maybe not even that much prior to the revolution where you have uh, sufficient labor, mostly in the form of enslaved people, you have sufficient capital coming in to allow for that, and you have uh, sufficient goods going out to allow for that. 
So this is going to be particularly uh, important for the daughters of those families because they are being raised to be this, this part of this leisure class that is supposed to be akin to the aristocratic uh, class of Europe, of the gentry of Europe, where uh, you have enough money to not work. Uh, and that means even the most uh, respectable, most uh, white collar possible trades you could think of. What you did was you ran your land, okay? And women weren't even doing that. Women were, uh, women's primary job, of course, is to produce heirs for her husband who's running the land. Now, this leisure class is especially visible in the South, okay? Um, slavery at this point was found throughout the colonies, okay? You find some little pockets, uh, particularly in areas where you have a majority Quaker population that uh, uh, do not have slavery in their area, but that doesn't mean it's illegal there, it's just they're not practicing it. Uh, but always there are still more slaves in the South, in the Southern colonies than there are in the North. Right? And that has a lot to do with the, the type of farming activity that goes on. It has a lot to do with when places were settled, what grows best there, that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, so this slavery basically puts women in a position of being able to completely avoid manual labor. And the avoidance of that labor was seen as feminine, okay? So a woman not having to uh, even do so, something so simple as to make herself a cup of tea or coffee is indicative of her social status, okay? Now, as an aside, when we get to the, uh, the American Civil War, the great-granddaughters of these women and great-great-granddaughters of these women are in a very difficult position because some of them are left completely without any help, uh, enslaved or not, and there, if you read the, the discussions of this stuff, some of them didn't even know how to properly dress themselves. And when I say properly, I mean just getting dressed, not, uh, not like some, you know, squeezing yourself like Scarlett O'Hara into five layers of, of a dress and, and hoops and everything. Um, there's in particular two accounts that I recall reading where uh, the one woman didn't know how to boil water to make herself a cup of tea and the other one didn't know how to, uh, it was something equally simple, uh, but I can't remember something about cooking. So this, this leisure class is putting itself in a position of uh, not being able to function without uh, uh, servants. And, and for them, it's gonna be enslaved people. So but that's, that's getting a little down the line. Now, women's appearance is intended to convey that lack of work, okay? A woman was always supposed to have uh, very pale hands, no, uh, uh, no calluses, no blisters, you know, perfectly manicured nails, nothing that would indicate that they might, uh, you know, have even had to, to pick up something, pick up a dish and put it in the, in the sink, okay? But the fashion of the era is particularly indicative of this, okay? The, the fashion at that time was to have very tight corsets, okay? So you would be very uh, cinched up around the waist, okay? To, uh, often to the point where you might not be able to even take a deep breath, okay? And then you have a very large skirt that's held out with hoops and petticoats and uh, the little things on the side that make it uh, stick out to the sides, but not the front. I think that's called a farthing dale, but don't quote me on that. So it's a pannier. <laughs> pannier, thank you. Pannier. All right, pannier. I don't know what a farthing dale is. I don't know where that came from. Okay. Uh, that's Elizabethan. Oh, okay. A little bit off. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, so they had the, the, the skirts that are set up in this way. And you can imagine how difficult it would be just to walk through a room without knocking something over if it's not designed around the idea of having women uh, with these massive skirts there, okay? Um, there is a, you know, much less do anything else. There's a, a, a meme that's been going around and I forgot to put it in the lecture here, but you may have seen it where there's, it's, 
the picture is of a woman with a massively wide skirt and it usually has text that's something to the effect of when you go to your friend's party and want to steal their 60 inch tv or something like that and and that's what it was so so you can imagine just trying to do any type of work in that that kind of fashion even put these women in a position where they might not be able to bend over and pick up their own children okay uh, it, imagine trying to bend over with those very tightly, uh, tightly wound uh, corsets. Okay, so uh, that in itself, a, a a woman who is dressed that way is showing her uh, social status, is showing her value within that system, uh, and and then the less fancy and the less, uh, uh, excuse me, I should say the less ornate and the smaller your skirts are, the more indicative of having to do some kind of labor, right? Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you're supposed to have uh, creamy white skin. Don't be outdoors, don't be in the sunlight. Um, we like a tan on people in the modern day, but at that time it was just indicative of having to work outside. And so women, if you did have to go outside for anything, made sure you, uh, your face was covered, not quite a little house on the prairie style bonnet, but there were ways to, uh, uh it, well, for these women, they would have probably had a slave holding a parasol over their heads. So, and additional to this, the ideal for women's body shape was to be, uh, have very thin, limbs, okay, indicating that they had done no activity that could produce muscles, okay. So there's, that's a, a, an interesting thing to look at there because doing no activity is also, has the potential to cause you to become overweight. So you're going to have, uh, you could either have muscular arms or, you know, fat arms. <laughs> I guess, unless you're one of those lucky people who just stays thin. Um, so that was a double-edged sword there because it's at, at some point when you, you, know, you get to that age where you stop metabolizing everything like crazy, then you're going to have lost that ideal. But by that point, uh, you're married. You've probably had a couple of kids at least, uh, if not a half a dozen. So at that point, you're not worried about looking to the ideal. Now, for young and very rich women, they're going to be educated in the fine arts, okay? Um, music in particular was a big one. Women were expected to be able to uh, play the piano or pianoforte, um, maybe a, a, a violin, something like that, uh, accompany with music, of course, okay? Uh, women were taught drawing and painting that was considered an appropriate uh, uh, activity for women. Um, it went along with fine needlework because you could do the same kind of uh, ability to get the details in a drawing or a painting is going to be there for the needlework, just a different skill. And languages, languages were very, uh, were, were deemed to be very useful for women. Now, there's a lot of levels here. Uh, because for women to have these, to have, to have foreign languages, uh, it indicated that women had a certain capacity to learn things, but it didn't, that didn't extend beyond that type of thing. So, you know, a woman might be fluent in English and French and let's say Latin, um, but that ability to learn those things was not carried over within the society to the idea of say, maybe being able to uh, balance the books in her husband's accounts, you know, for whatever business he had. Uh, and of course, if you have, if you're in a position where you're not actually doing the housework, uh, you have to be taught how to manage uh, the people who are doing the housework for you. Now, generally speaking, that's going to be slave management uh, or management of paid servants. Um, it, those have some similarities, uh, but a lot of differences as well. Of course, if you have paid servants, you're just telling them like, you know, you're, you're making arrangements with them for whatever work they're going to do. Slave management involved also making sure that they had uh, the, the minimum requirements of life, that they had uh, a certain amount of food, that they got their, 
you know, one set of clothing a year, that kind of thing. And even though, as I said, with the languages, even though all of these activities required a certain level of acumen, the girls were taught to hide their intelligence and act as though they were naive and incapable of understanding anything but the most basic concepts in front of men, particularly men who they were hoping to uh, court or marry. Okay. And coming to that, women were supposed to be practically hostile to the women, excuse me, to the men courting them. Okay. Because even to portray an interest, a slight interest uh, in, in romance or, or you know, the baseness of sexual attraction was deemed to be beneath them. So the more hostile a woman was to a potential suitor, the more likely it was she was interested, I guess you could say. Um, that's the standard, okay. Um, the reality of it is, of course, humans are human, okay. Uh, the, if you look through the registries of, of weddings, you do see a lot of pregnant brides. It's not gonna say it in the registry of the wedding, but if you look at the date of the wedding versus the date of the first child being born, you can figure it out. So it's, it's that is the standard. That's probably how the highest of the upper echelons were dealing with this. And part of that too, is that you're dealing with arranged marriages uh, higher up on the scale, okay? The more property you have, the more likely it is that it is your father who, I should say, the more property your family has, because you don't have it, uh, it's more likely that the, the head of the household, the father, is the one who is uh, deciding about the marriage prospects. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, he's going to just say, you're marrying so-and-so with no options for you, but it's going to be his decision to uh, whether or not the men who come into the household are appropriate to court his daughters. Uh, and anybody who's not is not going to get through the household, at least, yeah. except for those romance novels and all that, right? right. <laughs> now, uh, once married, in terms of legality, the wife ceases to exist, <laughs> okay? Um, she, uh, uh, of course, must change her name, okay? She goes from belonging to her father's family to her husband's family. Uh, most property is going to fall under his name. Any property that doesn't is going to be movable property. And there has to be a lot of legal rigmarole in order to make that happen. So that again, will depend on how much money her natal family has and whether or not they wanna make sure that she's in a position to uh, uh, maintain some of that fortune, even if her husband is very bad with money. Um, Right, and there is uh, in this era, no such thing as marital rape. Uh, a woman is obliged legally to have sex with her husband whenever he wants. Uh, she has no recourse on this. Um, and in fact, uh, if she were to try to uh, take that in front of a judge, uh, she'd probably be laughed out of court. Uh, another quote from Gail Collins, quote, Southern white womanhood was supposed to be submissive as well as frail and chaste the better to contrast with black women who were thought of as sturdy and sexually promiscuous. So part of that, that image of perfection, okay, is, uh, is that differentiation between master and slave. That's a very important element. So getting into what women's experiences of the revolution itself were, of course, you don't have, uh, you generally don't have women fighting. There are a few instances that we know of where uh, women got involved in the fighting either uh, because they were there under other circumstances or some few women who dressed as men and, and went and got involved in the fighting that way. Not nearly as many as in the American Civil War, at least that we know of. That's the problem with that. If they were successful at this, uh, uh, if they were successful at hiding their sex, then you know we still don't know. And there's no way for us to know unless they've been found out. So uh, not something that is, is well known for this era. 
But women do have to be part of this revolutionary movement from the beginning. Okay. They are, they are equally benefiting from the things that prompt the revolution. And the main thing that prompts the revolution is the gain in land after the French and Indian War. Okay. So just very briefly, the French and Indian War is an extension of what's called the Seven Years War in Europe. Okay, the Seven Years War was being fought over who got to have control of the Austrian throne, okay, and, and parts of Prussia and some other things. And so that extended into the colonies because the English were on one side of it and the French were on the other. So here's an opportunity to, you know, let's go try to kill each other on another continent over this. Well, in the Americas, in North America, rather than you know, having any interest in the Austrian throne at all, okay, it's about who controls the land, uh, basically what would be the modern day Midwest, what, was, uh, what became a chunk of the North, a chunk of which became the Northwest Territory, but it's also uh, territory south of that as well. So uh, if we think, you know, Ohio, Michigan, of course, uh, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, uh, Missouri, Mississippi, that era, area, I'm trying to think. So like everything west of what we think of as that, the, those seaboard colonies, okay. Even though the, the English charters said that the colonies had everything west of them until the other end of the continent, nobody knew quite where that was. No accurate maps had been made. Very few people had uh, been on the west coast of North America who had also been on the east coast of North America. So there's not a concept of, of truly how much land that is, okay? And there won't be until it, after the Lewis and Clark expedition. And even then it takes a little more mapping. So, right, long story short, too late for that. The, the, uh, the French lose, okay? And it's called the French and Indian War because the French and the tribesmen primarily fought against the British. There were a few tribes who sided with the British, uh, hoping that that would save them territory. Uh, it did not, but we can get into that in a different class. At the end of the French and Indian War, okay, which officially ends with the surrender of uh, the city of Montreal to the British, okay, uh, the French uh, removed their official presence from North America, and that's in 1763. Okay. Right. At that point, all of the territory that the French claimed went over to the British, uh, with the exception of some few little, like some islands in the Caribbean and some other, but basically everything on the continent that was French went over to the British. Now, the French had done this thing where instead of setting up colonies and settlements the way that the English did, they set up a few settlements, a few cities, okay, uh, uh, what became, uh, well, not, excuse me, not what became, but Montreal, Quebec, um, New Orleans, Le Detroit, okay, Detroit was a French settlement, uh, uh, Michel Mackinac, all of that, uh, and a lot more in between, but primarily what the French did was they'd go into an area, they'd plant their flag, they'd make friends with the natives, they'd do some trading, and then they'd move on. And so the territory that they claimed was a great deal larger than what the English claimed, okay? And if you think about what the map of North America looks like, if you think about like just basically what is now Canada, uh, all of that area west to about, oh, probably around where the Dakotas are, um, not exactly, but I don't have the map right in front of me. So that was all claimed by France, okay. Um, and then go south, okay. And everything up to the Northern border of what the Spanish claimed in North America was claimed by the French. So the English had this little, little strip of colonies on the, on the East Coast, okay. And then for the most part, it's either the French or the Spanish that claim the rest of the continent. So the French lose the war, they leave. All of the territory west of the Appalachian Mountains, okay, and a, a particular line on a map that's called the Proclamation Line of 1763. All of that land 
now belongs to the British. But on the Western side of the 1763 proclamation line, the English are not supposed to settle without explicit permission from the British government. Okay. That territory was supposed to be left for the tribes. Um, now, there were some exceptions to that. Uh, Michigan, of course, uh, Detroit had a very large settlement, relatively speaking, for the time at this point. Uh, so they weren't going to move people out of that. Uh, cities that had been established or, or major towns that had been established were left where they were. Okay? So it wasn't perfect because the English had already been pushing into this territory. But the idea was uh, to come to an understanding with the tribes of which land they would maintain and which land uh, uh, the English would maintain. So the colonists didn't care, okay? The colonists look at this and they say, we fought the war here, okay? We shed our you know, blood, sweat, and tears for this chunk of land. We are physically here to deal with this chunk of land. Okay, as opposed to King George and his men who are on the other side of the Atlantic. And so we want this land and we don't care what the people on the other side of Atlantic say about it. That is really the first place where the American Revolution starts. It's not the taxation issue. Okay? Um, the taxation issue was a, it was one last thing that they could complain about and use as a reason to break away. Okay. The, the real thing is, is that they wanted to be able to expand into the Western territories, particularly in the South, uh, to use those territories for growing things like indigo, like tobacco, later cotton, although cotton is not uh, as valuable a product even with slave labor uh, until after the invention of the cotton gin, which is at the end of the century. So they're pushing to go West. Um, the British government is telling them no, and that's, that's the beginning of that. So when I say women benefited alongside men from these territorial gains, of course they did, okay? It's not just the men that are going out and taking this territory. It's not just the men who are going to benefit from uh, the financial situation of the family changing for the better or worse, okay? Um, and so then where the taxes come in, is to pay for the war, okay? Uh, up until the, French, the end of the French and Indian War, into the 1760s, uh, the Americans had not paid almost any of the taxes that other British uh, uh, territories, colonies, even the islands, uh, even the island of England itself were paying, okay? So when they are, they're presented with taxes, and they're presented with an amount of money that they are supposed to, that the British government feels that they need to pay uh, to account for the British aid in winning this war, in fighting and winning this war. And so the, this is gonna be the, the stamp tax and the tea tax and the, uh, there's tax on lead and paper eventually, although that's later. Um, and there's, I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but they're told, okay, this is the amount of money you owe these taxes are going to be created to collect that amount of money, okay? Everybody else is paying these already. There, was enough, there were enough goods coming out of the Americas that they didn't bother with the taxes at that point, until that point. And then they said, but these taxes will be delayed a year before we start implementing them. And if you come up with a better or more effective or a different way that will get the money, that you can deal with uh, better, okay, then as long as you get us the money, we don't really care how you do it, okay? But if you don't, you're gonna have these taxes. So the American colonies were actually given an opportunity to find some other way of paying this money and they just outright refused. And it is because they, they felt that they owned the land and it was theirs to do with as they pleased. And they were losing any allegiance they'd had to the British government as such uh, long before 1776. So of course the year passes and they don't, they don't come up with a way to do it. They could have passed a hat around, 
if they wanted to, in a figurative or literal sense, the British government would not have cared as long as the, the money was found some way. All right, so this is the situation going into the revolution. And then we have the boycotts and the, uh, the anti-British actions, things like the Boston Tea Party. Now, women did get involved in these, okay? Uh, as Howard Zinn says, uh, as Howard Zinn says, and I have that in a different spot, okay. Uh, women formed patriotic groups, carried out anti-British actions, wrote articles for independence. They were active in the campaign against the British tea tax, which made prices intolerably high. They organized the Daughters of Liberty groups, boycotting British goods, urging women to make their own clothes and buy only American-made things. Women are at the heart of the boycotting movement because women are the ones who have to figure out how to replace the goods that are being boycotted. Okay. The woman who is uh, uh, responsible for putting breakfast on the table every morning with a cup of tea has to figure out something other than tea to put down with that breakfast, okay. which is one of the reasons we like coffee so much in this country. We'll get to that. Right, so, so there's no question that these actions are political, okay? Uh, again, from, oh, this is from Birkin. Women who boycotted tea and wore dresses of homespun rather than imported cloth publicly defined these choices as political ones. But, okay, and the, and the men welcome that. But then the women started saying, well, if you're gonna remove yourselves from this authority, then why can't we remove ourselves from your authority? Uh, to which the men said, oh, no, no, that's not what we meant. And the enslaved people said the same thing. And they said, no, 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 that's not what we meant. Um, again, from Birkin, quote, for a small number, the revolution provided opportunities that peacetime did not. Opportunities that ranged from participation in meaningful activities to the promise of freedom from slavery. Yet for most women, the war was a conflict that taxed their resiliency and endangered their husbands and family. So, right, women are always involved in a war, whether or not they're actually fighting in it. Now, looking at the situation <laughs> from Britain, the fact that, and, and for the, the loyalists in the colonies, the fact that the women were so heavily involved in this was just yet another reason why the colonists were absolutely crazy, okay? Look at these people, they're letting their women get involved in politics. They're letting their women dictate whether they're going to be using particular goods or not, uh, all of that. And, and so that was just yet another reason that the colonies, that this, this revolution in the colonies had to be put down Okay, because uh, the, the second class and lower citizens were getting out of hand. Now, of course, women's solidarity is very important. As I mentioned, they're the ones who have to figure out how to replace those goods. They are also often used as an example of the ills done by the British because they are personally being hurt by the taxes or they have been widowed by the French and Indian War, not just widowed, lost fathers, lost sons, however, to work it into the narrative. America was also uh, personified as female, okay? So uh, there's those, there's political cartoons of the era that show America as a woman. There's one where uh, you see a woman prone and she's being held down and they're, they're pouring tea down her throat. They're forcing her to drink that particular tea. Uh, so, so there is all that, that feminine imagery that goes along with this. Uh, again, from Birkin. Quote, generally, cl generally crowd actions organized by elites conform to genteel notions of respectability and discourage female participation. But the more spontaneous the demonstration, the more likely the participation of women. Women joined in the tarring and feathering of local merchants, merchants who continued to import British goods and sometimes organized their own intimidation efforts against the perceived enemies of both sexes. There were women who made, uh, there were women who put together uh, uh, groups, young women who said that they would refuse 
to uh, marry any men who were not revolutionaries, who were not patriots, as they were called. Um, there were women who uh, threatened to leave husbands because they would not be involved in this. Um, the picture on the previous slide is of a uh, little girl, her name escapes me, but there was the story of how she's sitting there amongst very genteel company and her presence there was a very particular honor for her. And when she was served tea, she walked over to the window and threw it out <laughs> and uh, uh, caused quite a, quite a stir. So you have on the one side, these, or, these organized demonstrations that are done by the middling to upper class men, the ones who are really concerned about the taxes. Okay. Bottom of the barrel here, you know, the, the poor, the people who are working as day laborers who are living hand to mouth, they don't care about these taxes, one, because it's mostly not going to affect them. Okay, and two, they don't perceive that there's anything they can do about it until the elites rile them up and tell them there is, okay. So you might have something like the Boston Tea Party, which was a group of uh, relatively well-off men who go and destroy this tea, okay. The fact that some of them were uh, uh, merchants who were bringing in, who were smuggling goods like tea that was not brought up but had a great deal to do with it. Um, and that's the kind of thing that women would not be participating in, of course, because women are too genteel to do something like that. But when you have something like a, a, a tax collector who is going from house to house to make sure that the paper is stamped and things like that, or who has set up shop in town square or something, um, and there's a spontaneous demonstration against him, women will get involved. Uh, uh, very often, I don't want to say more violently than the men, but often it was. Um, the, the issue of the tarring and feathering, um, if anybody's seen, and this is going back over a decade now, but if anybody saw the HBO John Adams, okay, in the very, I think it's the very first episode, there is a, a portrayal of one of these men being tarred and feathered. And, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, I learned about that in probably middle school. You know, you get that phrase of like, oh, they were tarring and feathering the, the tax collectors. And, and it's not really explained what that means. Um, tarring was, you would take tar and it would be heated to the point where it was melted, okay, which is, you know, quite, quite hot, all right. Uh, and then that would be poured on the person, okay, usually after they were stripped naked. So that's, you know, your best case scenario there is to come out of that with third degree burns. Most people were debilitated by it, to whom it happened. A lot of people died right then and there because of it, because of the shock to the system, or because of uh, the, the burns and infections after the fact. And then you added feathers to it because that made it itchy and worse. Um, yeah. And, and women got involved in that and, and were, were just as happy to, uh, to participate in that kind of violence. Uh, now, women's reactions uh, tended to be mixed to the call to arms. And, and that's understandable. Okay, you have some who are just, yes, you know, we're, we're behind you, go, you know, kick those British out, uh, fight for our liberties, blah, blah, blah. And of course, then there are uh, others who, even if they believe in the cause, do not want to lose their loved ones, okay? Uh, even if they, uh, they feel that it's perfectly right. And again, much the same as in any war. So for non-combatants, uh, the primary experiences of this war as with most wars are going to be as citizens of occupied cities or as refugees who are fleeing from the approaching army. And then of course, as uh, family members of those who are wounded or killed in battle. Birkin talks about this and looks at this from the standpoint of 
American women who were living this understood that there could be no such thing as a civilian in this in this type of war. Um, there's discussion about this. There we go. Uh, oh, same picture. I didn't realize I did that. Okay. So there's discussion about this in uh, uh, Daniel Borston's American series, which I, I've mentioned in previous uh, previous classes. And he talks about this not from the standpoint of the women, but from the standpoint of who's fighting for what. Okay. The British are sending soldiers across the Atlantic to fight somewhere they had never been. They might not have even known it existed or only vaguely heard of it. Okay. Um, and they're fighting for pay and they're fighting because they're part of the army and that's what they are. The Americans are fighting in front of their homes and fields and families. And when you put those two things against each other, the ones who are fighting for their home and family are going to do everything they possibly can to win. And a lot of times they are going to be the ones who do win because they are, they have so much more reason to fight and so much more reason to win because of what they could lose as opposed to the people who are just there fighting for pay. Um, I'm not the first by any means to compare the American Revolution and Vietnam, but it is a good comparison. Uh, it is that colonialist grab and the idea that you are sending a lot of men somewhere where they have no reason to care whether or not the war is won or lost, other than their own lives. Now, one of the things that prompted the, uh, again, prompted the Declaration of Independence, one of the intolerable acts was uh, that the British government required the boarding of soldiers. Okay. Uh, that's why that's uh, in our, our uh, Bill of Rights that we would not be required to board soldiers uh, without recompense anyway. So uh, when you have this situation where the soldiers are being boarded, of course, it's going to be women's responsibility to deal with most of what those men need. Okay, it's their responsibility to feed them. It's their responsibility to wash their clothes, anything like that. And of course, they have to maintain supplies for their own family amidst this as well. Uh, so that was one of the big things that the revolutionaries presented as a reason that women are being so hurt by the British policies. Okay. And then of course the Americans did the same thing. Yeah, but that was different because they were the Patriots, right? Another thing that civilians, women or men have to deal with uh, in this kind of a situation is disease following the army. Okay, and there's a great book that is particular to the smallpox epidemic uh, that was a contributing factor in the end of the war. Um, and that's uh, Pox Americana by Elizabeth Fenn. It, disease and hunger come together, of course. Okay, uh, you have situations where the armies are coming through. It doesn't matter which side, you know, British people or Americans uh, taking all of your crops, camping on your land. Um, it's going to cause famine. It's going to cause disease because of, uh, just because you have people traveling and also because there's uh, the, the water may be dirtied, the food may be uh, damaged, you know, dirtied, things like that. So you have always following an army, uh, uh, hunger, dysentery, cholera sometimes, um, you know, all of those types of things. Added to that, of course, for women, you have, um, uh, uh, how to put this, oh, not bluntly, uh, uh, rape caused pregnancies, okay, which will follow in the wake of an army. Uh, so, yeah. excuse me, gotta have that coffee, okay. So you have the, the armies coming in, they're gonna, they're gonna steal crops. Uh, they're going to destroy land even if they don't steal the crops. Now in the cities, okay, 
it's a little bit different because you're not dealing with like farmer's fields where you're going to have uh, uh, food that is out there to be taken or just, uh, you know, fields that are going to be destroyed by either fighting or camping or whatever. But you have them coming in and the supplies are differently handled. There's people having their homes what they need and people come in and take it. You know. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's always this added fear of rape because, uh, because that's part of what a conquering army does. Uh, and it doesn't get reported because it wasn't punished often. And we're still in an era when pregnancy was believed, oh, it was believed that a woman could not get pregnant unless she enjoyed the act. Uh, so a woman who was impregnated by a rape was perceived to have uh, not actually been raped, okay? In fact, some of these women were uh, uh, accused of and convicted of adultery because they became pregnant from a rape uh, well, their husbands were gone, so. And of course, there's all sorts of work that women have to pick up as the men go to war, okay? Um, well, on one hand, you have women who are incredibly intelligent, uh, knowing uh, all the languages and everything that I talked about earlier and hiding it. On the other hand, you're going to have women who have no choice but to use those skills uh, to take over the family businesses. Okay. So you have a lot of women running shops, you have women running farms, um, less so in the South in terms of the moneyed, the upper classes, because of course uh, the upper class men were not out there doing the fighting uh, except as high up officers. But even then there'd be people to, to handle the business other than the wife and daughters. But when you're looking at middling class, you usually have uh, the women involved in this. Now, in some of the areas where there's less fighting or there is a short period of fighting and then things go back to relative normalcy, I'll say, uh, people were able to maintain themselves at their previous standards, okay? If you're somewhere that the fighting is not affecting what you have access to on a day-to-day -day basis, or maybe only slightly so, like, oh, you can't get your tea or you can't get your coffee, um, then you can function better than somebody who is, uh, you know, who's looking at a battle sitting right out their window, okay? And some of these people are even able to profit from the war. You're always going to have people who are looking to profit from conflict, uh, uh, it's the old the Ferengi rules of acquisition for the Czechies. Peace is good for business, war is good for business. There's always some way you can make money off of either of those. Um, particularly merchants, if they could still get goods that were needed by the army, then they could sell them at almost any price they wanted, particularly, um, particularly uh, uh, uniforms for the Americans and uh, ammunition for the Americans. Those were big ones that were, were badly needed and food too. Although that was not as much, um, there was not as much, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Gouging, price gouging on the food, but it was there. And you do see some men who desert uh, to, to go home and help their families. They get letters from home you know, we can't survive without the work that you would normally be doing. Uh, so you get deserters. That's uh, also very common in the Civil War um, because the situation, uh, people's situation is not such that there's regular pay going out, okay? All, all the, the Americans that were fighting in this war for the uh, Continental Army were supposed to be paid on a regular basis, but they, they often weren't. And even when they were, it didn't always make it back to the family if they sent anything back at all. Uh, so there was a lot of privation that goes with a war that's on your own territory. Now there was also some of what we would think of as traditionally women's work that's applied to the war effort, okay? Um, 
producing cloth and turning it into uniforms, uh, mending, uh, you know, uh, uh, knitting socks, um, laundry, feeding the, the soldiers when they're nearby, that kind of thing. Uh, that was all considered good patriotic war effort type work too. You do have some women who follow the men to the fighting, okay? And they fall into a few different categories. They're all termed camp followers, okay? But the term camp followers has a, uh, a connotation of prostitution, okay? But not all camp followers were prostitutes, okay? All the prostitutes that were following the camp were camp followers, I guess you could say, but not all of the camp followers were prostitutes. So they're in the baggage train of the army. And a lot of times you have the wives of soldiers and uh, uh, maybe sisters, daughters of soldiers um, who follow their men to the war for many, many different reasons. Okay. Um, part, you know, some of these women talk about uh, in their own writings, uh, they wanted to be close by in case their family member was killed or injured so that they could care for them um, or if they're, they become ill. Um, there's at least one account that I've read of a woman who, was, uh, who simply wanted to stay near her husband because she thought that he would be cheating on her the whole time <laughs> that he was gone if she wasn't uh, available for him. Um, there's women who see this as the only way to contribute that you know, they can't go be a soldier so they can at least uh, be part of the baggage train for the soldiers and, and help, okay. And so they act as cooks, laundresses, and nurses primarily, okay. You also see uh, some of these women setting up little, for lack of a better term, shops or kiosks where they might uh, be paid to mend clothing for the soldiers or uh, uh, pr produce other goods for the soldiers. As I mentioned, yes, prostitutes, of course, are gonna be found among the camp followers. This is a huge issue because of the spread of disease, okay? Um, where, the, where the family member camp followers were generally tolerated uh, by the upper echelons, the officers and such, because their presence actually provided something for the army, okay? If they were acting as a cook or a laundress or a nurse or whatever, then that was something that, a, a duty that men could be taken away from. If you have the women who are in the baggage drain doing the cooking, you don't have to have uh, men who would otherwise be soldiering doing the cooking, okay. Um, and it's also, they're also perceived as getting better service out of the men because the men know that their wives and children are okay. And, and that they can see them on a regular basis. And so there's less of the homesickness, less of the melancholy, uh, less of the depression of being separated from family. Uh, but prostitutes are prostitutes. And they tried to get rid of them a number of times and it never works uh, for very long. And uh, we don't see in the American Revolution what happens again in the American Civil War with that, where in some cases the generals would uh, regulate the prostitutes, basically make sure that they were healthy um, before they would allow them to uh, apply their trade, as it were. That's where the term hooker comes from, which I'm sure you guys know, but uh, General Hooker's girls, who he made sure that they were, they were disease-free for uh, his soldiers so that his soldiers would not be brought down by that and then possibly you know, lose a battle because of that. Uh, there were in those groups, okay, women who acted as water carriers, ammunition carriers. Uh, so they ended up accidentally <laughs> participating in combat, I guess you could say. Um, there's, you know, the, the famous uh, Molly Pitcher, you know, taking over the gun after her husband is killed. Uh, that's, she was, she, uh, that is indicative of a, somebody who was a water and ammunition carrier going back and forth. Um, you also see, like I said, some of the women adopting male identities. Probably the most famous of these is, is a woman named Deborah Sampson Gannett, but there's others out there that we'll never know about. So. 
But one thing that women could do and were often used for in the uh, in, in an official capacity was spies, was spying. Okay. Um, back when I was talking about the upper class women learning languages, I neglected to mention that that was a politically useful thing for their husbands. Because a woman who, let's say she knows French and they are at a dinner with the French ambassador or something like that, uh, she will be able to listen in on a conversation that nobody thinks she can understand and then report back that information, right? Same kind of thing here. Uh, women were not expected to be in places, uh, women, women were not expected to be in places where these types of things went on. So where you have, let's say, uh, a woman who is uh, uh, doing, whose house has been occupied by the British soldiers, and it's her job to feed and, you know, do their laundry and things like that, uh, they're not necessarily going to be concerned about discussing tactics in front of her because they don't think that she's at all relevant. Uh, and then she can turn around and give that information to the American soldiers. Yeah. I wrote it better on the, the slide there. I try not to say exactly what I have on the slide, but uh, they are able to rely on the gender standards at the time to make themselves appear unthreatening and allow them places, allow them access to places that were not available to more obvious spies. Yeah. Now the, uh, the, the, color picture there is a still from uh, the show Turn, Washington Spies. It was on AMC oh, a number of years ago, but it's based on a book by the same name that talks about uh, various spies that were involved in, uh, in the war, uh, particularly surrounding a man named Samuel Culper. Uh, and the reason I put that still in there was because uh, this, the, the character this woman is playing, and I, her name escapes me, but the way that she would indicate that she had information uh, for the Americans was that she would hang a black skirt out with whatever other laundry she might be doing. So they'd see that and then there was a, a place where she could leave the message uh, and that they would collect it and they would know it was there for them. It's a, it's a very good show, um, good book. I always say the book over the, the TV show or movie but the show is pretty good too. And, it was on Netflix, but I don't know if it still is. Yeah, anyway. So there are women involved in every bit of this. Um, just because they weren't out on the front lines fighting doesn't mean that there's not that kind of involvement. And of course, you know, anybody who looks at, at the history of these things well knows that, but it's still worth, uh, worth looking into because women do have different roles in different wars. There's always the camp followers, there's always the cooks and the laundresses, um, but the idea of having women spy is not something you see in every war. Okay. Um, women dressing up as men uh, to go to war is not something you see in, in every war. So. so then we win the war, yay. And we come into a period that's called the early Republic, okay? And this is just basically when we're putting together our government. Once we've won the war, we have to figure out what we're going to do with this. So the decision is made that it's going to be a, a Republic as opposed to a full democracy. I should say democratic Republic as opposed to a full democracy. Um, so that means that there's going to be representatives who are voted upon and then those representatives are going to make the laws as opposed to when you have what's uh, termed a full democracy where everybody votes, everybody who's eligible to vote is supposed to vote on laws and such like, uh, like that. So the roles of women in a lot of ways aren't gonna be changed by this, okay? Women are still, uh, okay, the primary caregivers for children, obviously they're the only ones who are producing, you know, actually birthing the children and breastfeeding and things like that. Um, they're still responsible for the upkeep of the household. They're still responsible for uh, all of those goods that are involved in the upkeep of the household and, and making sure that everybody gets their meals and all of that, general health care, the spiritual welfare, all of that. But there was a sense that some things needed to change. 
or at least there was a thought that they could change. Now, the men writing the constitution, okay, uh, were pretty unanimous in the idea that there's absolutely no reason for women to be involved in governing. Okay, and that's true of, I would say both the constitution and the, um, the constitution and the, the Articles of Confederation and all of the governing that was going on during the war as well. Okay, there was no, there was no point at which uh, there was any, anybody standing up there saying, you know, maybe we should let the women, at least the women who are property owners vote. Okay. Um, you will have likely heard of the, the famous letter uh, Abigail Adams sends to her husband, John Adams, while he's at the Constitutional Convention no, excuse me, at the, um, in the Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress of uh, remember the ladies because men will become, men will become despots in their own homes, okay? And so, you know, we all get that in middle school. I remember learning about that in middle school, but nobody ever tells of the other part of it where he responds with something to the effect of, uh, you know, your comment to remember the ladies made me laugh a great deal and, uh, I would be equally laughed at if I brought it up in, in Congress. So, you know, she was out there pushing for it, but he wasn't listening. But as I said, the voting rights were determined basically the same way they had been uh, in England. Okay. And that was true of the colonies from the get-go. You have this situation where um, in England, a certain property requirement was required that was redundant, a certain amount of property was required for voting. And that amount was set in such a way that most men were not gonna be able to vote. Yeah. But applying that same property right in the colonies and later in the United States, because there's so much more available land, that property requirement means that you have almost universal male suffrage. It's not quite entirely, but almost. Uh, and I should say universal free white male suffrage. So when the constitutions were, uh, when the constitution was put together, when the state constitutions were put together, they put in similar kind of property requirements. And some women were able to gain voting rights because those state constitutions did not specify men. It just said voters must have X amount of property okay? and be you know, X, uh, whatever age, usually 21 was considered adulthood at that point. Uh, so New Jersey in particular, that's the famous one. Uh, New Jersey didn't have a property requirement. The, the initial constitution opened the franchise to quote, all free inhabitants. And it stayed that way until 1807, at which point it was rewritten, uh, amended to specify all free men. Um, but between 1786, oh, whenever the New Jersey Constitution was instituted, I think, I think it's 1786, uh, and, and 1807, you have this period where women can vote in New Jersey, at least on the books. Um, of course, you don't have women who are involved in or who have access to higher education or the professions. Um, women were not going to be doctors. They could be midwives. They could be doctors for women, okay? Uh, they wouldn't be called that, but that's basically what it is. Um, they would not have access to you know, become teachers or anything like that, except at the lower primary level. Uh, we tend to think of teachers in the American past as primarily female that really doesn't happen until after the turn of the 19th century. And there's this push um, that is allowing, it's, it's this push that kind of has the idea that men have better things to do. And also women are suited to teaching because they're used to dealing with children. Um, it's just kind of this backhanded compliment, I guess. I don't know. Um, not I guess, I do know that's true. So, and you don't have any of the, the colleges in the colonies that are allowing women uh, even to take classes, uh, much less to get a degree, which some, some colleges in the United States don't allow women to get degrees until the 20th century. But that didn't stop them from being involved in politics, okay, because it affects them. Politics affects everything 
Okay. Again, to uh, go back to that HBO John Adams, there's a wonderful uh, conversation between Abigail and John. And I don't know if this is based on actual, like a letter between them or something, but uh, uh, he makes some offhand comment about she doesn't need to worry about politics. And she just, she says, when I go to the cupboard and there is no coffee and no hairpins and no meat for dinner, and there's a list that she gives, she says, is that not politics? Am I not dealing with politics? And it's true. Okay. So women did get involved and you do have some women advocating for this. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft is one in particular. She says, uh, let me see, as uh, Linda Kerber in a book called Toward the Intellectual History of Women says, Wollstonecraft ventured the suggestion that women might be able to study medicine, politics, and business, but whatever they did, they should not be denied civil and political rights. They should not have to rely on marriage for assurance of economic support. They should not remain immured in their families groping in the dark. There is a push here to de-infantilize women. And if women can take care of themselves and they can take care of their children and they do not need a husband, then that is going to upset the social apple cart, as it were. But we're not there yet, but this is good beginnings of it. Uh, you do see some, there's Wilson Craft, you do see some men also advocating for this. Like I say, not a lot. Um, if you read Thomas Paine's work, he very much was an advocate for women to be able to vote. Thomas Paine was wonderfully more revolutionary than any of us are taught in school. Um, Thomas Paine, uh, the book you should read on this is Harvey Kay's uh, biography of Thomas Paine's Thomas Paine and the American, it's not Thomas Paine and the American Dream. This uh, Harvey Kay's Thomas Paine book. Um, oh, look. Thomas Paine advocated for what we would call uh, a, a universal basic income in that era. He believed that every American citizen, male or female, when they are born should have a piece of land set aside for them that is then given to them when they are of age, 21 years old, that they can then do with as they wish. So they could sell it, they can live on it, they could uh, rent it, they could farm on it, whatever. And that was supposed to be a means of assuring that everybody at least had the minimums needed to survive, uh, which was revolutionary at the period. That's, that's still revolutionary uh, in the modern day. Um, and Thomas Paine also advocated for uh, what we would think of as universal health care as well, although not in the way that, um, you know, this, this whole thing of insurance and that and all of that, but just making sure that each town settlement, whatever, had enough doctors that uh, who were paid by the state, that part's the same, uh, to make sure that everyone was healthy and, and, and well and able to be uh, good citizens, you know, functioning citizens, I should say. Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, that's the book. All right. And then I already gave you the Mary Wollstonecraft quote. Um, she, uh, her, her work was very well received in the United States, um, mostly among women, as you might imagine. But it was this presentation of an idea of freedom that was something akin to what the Americans were arguing for, just explained in a different way. But the one thing, the one role, I guess you could say, that changed for women um, or it was adjusted for women was that of what they were responsible for as mothers, okay? And the ideal state of a woman who is a good citizen of the Republic is to have Republican motherhood. Um, and that meant that as a mother, they were instilling in their children the ideas of good citizenship, whether men or you know, male or female, daughters and sons both get that idea, but they're going to use it in different ways. Now, uh, again, with the, uh, <laughs> it's just still from, from John Adams there. Um, and this is something that Abigail Adams actually did. She, she was fluent in uh, not obviously English, of course, but uh, French, Latin, 
and something else. I want to say German, but don't quote me on that. And she made a point of teaching all of her children Latin. I mean, like, like from a very young age, girls and boys. Okay. And so she kind of gets put up as the example, the ideal of Republican motherhood, as it were, um, which is probably not too far off. Uh, Benjamin Rush explained it like this. Quote, the original share that every citizen has in the liberty and the possible share he may have in the government of our country make it necessary that our ladies should be qualified to a certain degree by a peculiar and particular, and, excuse me, by a particular and suitable education to concur in instructing their sons in the principles of liberty and government. Okay. So the idea that women will take in the ideologies of uh, being a participating citizen and then pass that on to her children is emphasized. But at the same time, uh, they're being told it's only, only your sons. You're gonna pass on the idea of passing it on to your daughters. But, okay, and this is where we see an advantage. This is uh, the first time in the modern era that we see arguments for women being at least minimally literate and numerate. Okay, all women across the board, whether they're, uh, you know, in the in the upper classes or uh, working class or middling or whatever. Okay, and that's. I'm not going to say it's entirely new. Okay, certainly literacy uh, is is something in the literate societies that is deemed important by all means, but women are always secondary to that because you don't have to be able to read to have children, right? So there wasn't that need uh, or the feel for that need. But now there is this idea that all Americans should be relatively well educated, at least to the point where they can teach their children how to be good citizens. And at least to the point where they can be, uh, for the men, where they can be informed voters. And so then, as I said, this is when teaching becomes a, um, a respectable career for women by the time you get you know, past the turn of the century and all that. Uh, right, okay, yeah, again from Linda Kerber. To attain a state of Republican motherhood, a woman had to be at minimum literate, but a wider education in history, philosophy, and languages was common, especially among the upper classes. And then she goes on, if the Republic were to fulfill the generous claims it made for liberty and confidence of its citizens, the education of young women would have to be an education for independence rather than for an upwardly mobile marriage. So the idea, even if you are teaching, even as you are teaching the sons, the principles of liberty and government, as, uh, as Dr. Rush said, you're teaching the daughters that you can be independent, okay? Not in the way that women are independent today, but you can have independent thought maybe outside of, of uh, what your husband tells you to think, or you can, your end all be all in life is not marriage, right? Not nearly as emphasized as in the modern day. I don't want you to think that, that it's like today where women were actually setting out to not get married. But the idea was that, yeah, that sounds too modern. I don't want to say, you know, you're not identified by your relationship with a man, because that is still the case at this point, but maybe it's not as important as it was, relatively speaking. Right, so as I said, this teaching became a respectable career. So women were able to spend some time teaching, say, before they married, okay? Or if they never married, they could continue teaching their entire lives and actually support themselves. And it wasn't considered inappropriate, okay. But all of this is glommed up, shall we say, by the quote unquote scientific ideas of the era, okay. And one of those was that the more educated a woman was, the more masculine she became. And that the most educated, these very, very well-educated women became unsexed, okay? Um, there was a belief 
and this sounds ridiculous, that as women grew more educated, their brains grew and their wombs shrunk so that a well-educated woman, woman did not produce, could not produce uh, children properly or did not have a uh, hospitable environment uh, for babies to gestate, okay? Now, that was believed, obviously not the case, okay? Um, the real concern is educated women uh, are going to try to remove themselves from the household and the feminine sphere. Okay, uh, throughout human history, well, let's say throughout the modern world, the more educated a woman is, on average, the fewer children she has. Okay, um, which does not really hit that that point until after uh, that point of no children potentially until after uh, the widespread use of birth control. But it, you know. It, a woman who is spending the time with the education is not, she's spending the years that she is uh, in this era, most fertile, okay? And, and most likely to have children in some kind of educational pursuit, okay? So that's, that's where that idea comes from. So despite all of this, Rarely in the literature of the early Republic do we find any objection to the notion that women belong in the home. What emerges is an argument that the revolution had enlarged significance of what women did in their homes. And to go on with uh, Dr. Kerber, properly educated uh, small R Republican women would stay at home and from a van that vantage point would shape the characters of their sons and husbands in the direction of benevolence, self-restraint and responsible independence. And that's a good place to end our discussion of women in early America. Um, a little earlier than I thought, but that's okay. So I'm gonna stop the recording here. Thank you again for listening and watching. For those of you who are watching later, uh, if you find this interesting, please don't hesitate to go look at SVSU's Ollie website for more opportunities to learn more things with uh, people like me and all of our other wonderful teachers.